Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Wald as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the cluster Songs of Parting. Now this will be an introductory set of lectures, our comments, and we're very interested in the ways in which this collection of some 17 poems is unique in Leaves of Grass and in our study of Leaves of Grass. Now some consider this actually and the poem so long to be really the end of Leaves of Grass and the second and uh, the first and the second annexes that will follow will then construct the last 106 poems of Leaves of Grass as we now are about ready to jump into it. Now, uh, the, the, there's a number of assumptions that we will have as we begin our study together. And this, uh, for those of you who have been studying with us at learnstrong.net, down that left hand side, talks with Walt. Uh, this will be for us then, uh, you know, old hat. But I want to go ahead and just give some early uh, assumptions and some comments about how we've been approaching all of the readings up to and including right up through from noon to starry night and that cluster. Uh, and what we've said from the very beginning is that we're trying to concentrate on this notion of the stories. Why? Because we are the stories that we tell and retell. We are the stories that we decide to accept and, of course, to reject. And Whitman is a great storyteller, even though, of course, many will say, well, he's just a poet. But no, no, he is a fundamentally a great storyteller, and he's always focusing on these stories. And obviously, those stories will build around our idea of our learning theory. That is to say, our goal, as always, to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. That is to say, the new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. And these echoes that we're constantly referencing as we get into the back end of Leaves of Grass. Those who have studied Leaves of Grass always are commenting on the way in which Whitman keeps coming back to major themes. Of course, the theme of departure and death as it will happen in this, cult, in this cluster will be important for us. Now, our annotative approach, we want to remind ourselves, because the language, the nomenclature that I use, hopefully will make sense. We're always asking three guiding questions when we pick up any one of these poems. What does the text say? What does it mean? And how can I relate to it in some meaningful way, vis-a-vis, -vis, obviously, our learning theory? And at level one, what does the text say? We're just summarizing. At level 2A, uh, we're asking about themes, messages, and 2B. That's our rhetoric. That's our rhetorical approach. That's our uh, literary analysis. Not what Whitman says, but how Whitman says it. And we're fascinated by the games that he plays in terms of the poetic tendencies that he will demonstrate. And then finally, at 3A, we ask, how can I relate this poem to other texts I'm familiar with? Obviously, beginning with poems and texts inside of Leaves of Grass and then, and then elsewhere. Uh, and then finally, at 3B, how can I relate this information to myself? As we say in 303, how can I own this material? How can I make this poem mine? And if this study for us has been anything from that very first invitational word come all the way to and including the previous uh, cluster of Noon to Starry Night, we're always asking what can I learn here that actually matters, that is enough to use the language of the first poem of this collection of, or, or this 17 poem collection. Uh, that is to say what can I, what can I be moved by? What can be challenged by? Now, as we look at every one of these poems, we want to remind you about what we call in 303 our big five. What does this text say about epistemology, ontology, psychology, sociology, and theodicy? Let's review them each in turn. What is epistemology? Well, the study of knowledge. What can I know? Of course, there are some people who say, I know absolutely I am right and you are wrong. Of course, as we've pointed out many times in 303, the only problem with that is people get hung on crosses, people get dismembered, airplanes fly into buildings and lots of people die. That is to say, that absolutist epistemological position, while sometimes necessary, most of the time is pretty dangerous. Of course, the opposite of that on the spectrum is the relativist position. There are no absolutes, there are no truths of any kind, which of course is a problem, as we commented on it many times with the performative contradiction. To say there are no absolutes is to posit an absolute. To say there is no truth is to posit a truth. To argue there is no mind is to posit a mind, and to that degree, the relativist position for us epistemologically is a pretty weak one, which obviously is the reason why a lot of people run back to the absolutist position. But there is a third position, and it's the position of Whitman. That is to say, the fallibilist position about epistemology and what you can know. I think I'm right, 
but I could be wrong. It's fundamentally what, the, what we inherit in the West, especially through the scientific enlightenment. True science is not scientism. True science says, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. I'm always open for more data. Now the flip side of that first coin of the big five, along with epistemology, is ontology. That is to say, who are you? Who am I? Well, obviously I'm a body, but I'm also a mind or a psyche, a soul, a spirit. So there's more to me than just simply my body. And as Whitman will say it in Song of Myself 48, I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I've said that the body is not more than the soul, and nothing not God is greater to one than oneself is. That idea of being at least two, possibly three, if you want to argue that there is a body, mind, and then there's something beyond that, a spirit or whatever, a soul. We're going to immediately get into this, and, and, and we're going to see it again in these poems. Now, psychology, sociology is two sides of the next coin, if you will, right? On the psychology side, that is to say the study of individual, what, motives, motivations, and the like dealing with fear and pain and anxiety as it relates to the individual sociology, just the study of the group on the same count. And we're going to notice that Whitman dances between the two. Often he'll be very interested in the individual, often he'll be very interested in the group. And of course for him, America is fundamentally that tension between leave me alone, I'll do whatever I want, and hey, we're a collective group, we got to be able to figure this stuff out together. That's called a democracy. Now, the last of our big five, we have said, might be the most important of our big five in our study of Lisa Grass, the question of theodicy. That is to say, why must there be pain and suffering in this world? Now, for Whitman, the greatest exemplar of this question was the Civil War itself. Oh, man, it was terrible for him to witness because he so genuinely believed that maybe his collection of poems in 1855 would keep... America from tearing itself in half. And when it didn't happen, it broke his heart. But being, as he said, I live on the sunny side of life, being the optimist that he kind of wanted to be, even though he wasn't always the optimist, he wanted to argue that when bad things happen, like the war, we can't ask why did this happen to us. We have to learn to ask why did this happen for us. For Whitman, changing that preposition from two to four allows us to not be as individuals or as a group seen as victims in a world where we have no control. We're able to figure out ways to work together and come through our pain to the other side. Now we'll talk about Whitman, but really we talk about five Whitmans at least, the five P's or perspectives on Whitman. And obviously there's more than that. We don't, uh, we, uh, we don't just limit it to these five, but we're certainly going to talk about Whitman as person, his biography. He is a man aging as he is constructing a number of these poems, and certainly in the Deathbed Edition, as he's putting these 17 poems in this cluster, he's an old man and he's starting to already see it, right? As he's, again, as he's beginning to kind of think about um, the party, the departure that will happen. We see him, of course, as a poet. Whitman is poet, no question, and he is that, although he didn't start out to be that. That's important that he didn't start out to be a poet. He was a great builder. He was a great educator, as we'll get to the next P. The third P is pedagogue or instructor. And I've made this argument, and again, it always, to me, comes back to Song of Myself, Passage 6, Song of Myself, Passage 46, 47. To me, that's fundamental to reading Leaves of Grass. Go back and look at our comments there at Learn Strong if you haven't been with us for those comments, because that, to me, is what Whitman always was. He was a, it was a heart. He was, a, he was an educator. He was a pedagogue. He was a teacher. And he wanted to educate through leaves of grass. And I, he's going to do a lot of that here as well. Um, of course, he was also a politician, a great lover of democracy. So we're going to see those themes being played out here and as well. He was a great philosopher. He was a great thinker. Everybody from Socrates to Emerson and Hegel have influenced his thinking. And we're going to see that played out here as well. I mean, think about it. There is... Socrates sitting in his cell, we read about this in Plato's Phaedo, that great dialogue that we've given full lecture on at LearnStrong.net. And the disciples or the students of Socrates are, I mean, they're crying, their hearts are broken, because there's that cup with the hemlock in it, the poison, that Socrates is about to drink in 399 BCE, being accused of the state as being an atheist and a corrupter of the very students that are sitting in the cell with him. And they can't understand why he's so excited to drink this hemlock and get on out, uh, on out of this thing called his life to take his next journey. And it will be in this classic dialogue that he will make the argument, look, there's my body, but you've always known that was going to go away. Of course, there is something else going on here, and I'm very excited to take the journey. That is to say, Socrates is the new Odysseus, if we will. Finally, the assumption is that you have 
purchased your own copy, that is a deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass, you're reading this material on your own, and then you're coming to our comments here as a way to help you to amplify what you've already learned. That would be the ultimate way to treat each one of these poems. And there's no way that what I'm going to be able to say in any one of these lectures is inclusive. So much debate about so much of what Whitman was saying or not saying, and these 17 poems will play the exact same game, which is why this is such rich territory. That's why we love it so much, all right? That's why we love it so much. Now, let's think a little bit about the very title of the cluster itself, um, this idea of songs of parting. You'll remember in Song of Myself 29 that the word parting gets used. Do you remember behind the swarthy face, um, um, parting kisses, he uses that phrase. Do you remember in the poem, what think you I take my poem? Do you remember this parting the parts of, the, of dear friends? Um, th this idea of leaving and departure is central. And of course, hello, anytime he uses the word songs, we obviously will hark back to song of myself. Now in this, just to finish now, here are introductory comments. In this collection of poems, we're going to be focusing on death. We're going to be focusing on departure. We'll go back to poems like Passage to India, right? Um, Think of it this way, as we've said so many times. They were teaching you at a very young age when you were swinging at the park. It's time to go bye-bye. we got to go to the van, honey. And you said as a child, what? No, I don't want to go to the van. I want to keep swinging. To which some adult in your life had to say, honey, honey, you can't stay at the park and swing forever. you got to go to the van. From a very young age, they were teaching us what? Well, exactly what we're going to learn here in Songs of Party Cluster. That is to say, the van's always been waiting. You only get to swing at the park for a very brief period of time. You have not met any 200-year-old people. Let that sink in. Whoever's swinging at the park, you only get to swing for a very short period of time. That makes it precious, and therefore swing well, as we have often said, right? And because that's the case, we're going to be working with that same idea of swinging well. And when it comes time to go to the van, as it will for all of us, right? How do you look back at your swinging? How do you look back at your life? We're going to hear some of that in these 17 poems. Now, time will be a central point here, and the passage of time. You'll remember in 46, I know I have the best of time and space. It was never measured and, was, and never will be measured, and yet that time is coming to, at least temporal time, is coming to its end, and how do we deal with that? Um, now, there's an argument that a number of these poems are lesser known, although a couple of them are important, and we'll point it out when we get there. S uh, Song at Sunset and the very last poem, So Long, have received some pretty critical acclaim. But we're going to argue, and I've, I've made this argument to you guys already, I don't think there's any throwaway lines or poems in Leaves of Grass. I think they're all important, and hopefully they can all help us. Now, notice we're going to begin with some pretty sad oppressive, some have called it somber kind of tone in uh, as time draws nigh, but we're going to get to some kind of maybe optimism and some soaring um, ex exhilaration even is how one scholar has pointed out in Song at Sunset. We're going to see Whitman's treatment of death as interesting here. Maybe it's uncertain, maybe it's paradoxical, it's definitely often contradictory. I mean, he'll see death as both a conclusion as well as a fulfillment. He's going to see it as this terrible, terrifying kind of thing, and then at the same time, beautiful. Um, and then there's going to be the question of what happens after you die, the afterlife question, as we as we've commented already with Plato's Phaedo. And, and uh, T.S. Eliot will borrow heavily from this idea, right, from East Coker, in my beginning is my end. In joy, shipmate, joy, he will say, our life is cloud, uh, uh, our, our life is closed, our life begins. That idea that death is the beginning and the ending at the same time. That is to say, he's going to look at death and, and his defiance to death in at least three from three perspectives. His body will go back to nature, go back to Song of Myself 6. That return is, is brilliant and beautiful. Or democracy the death of democracy never happens. Democracy lives on, even though one individual dies. Or, as we might think about it, one individual drop of water goes back to the waves, it's to the water, to the ocean itself. And then finally, of course, he's going to argue that leaves of grass will have its perpetual kind of life afterwards. And we'll see this. He's playing with future readers, and he'll, be, he'll talk about his book here for the one and only time in this, in this cluster. You'll remember that he even in Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking called death the delicious word death. And so there will be an attempt 
I think, in the theodicy of Leaves of Grass to come to terms with the fact that, man, if you love swinging, and this is, I think, Whitman's challenge, when you, if you love swinging so much at the park, the idea of going to the van is very, very unsettling because you want to have more time to swing. But then you realize, and after the war, as we commented in drum taps, especially Windresser, that experience really did damage his health. And by 73, he's having issues. Of course, his stroke, the death of his mommy, and all of those terrible tragedies start to pile up so that by the end of his life, it is going to be hard on him to come to terms with the fact that it had to happen. And of course, in the end, right, the 26th of March, 1892, at 72, it does happen. And we've got, we've got to live this with him, right? There's going to be so many amazing echoes from earlier poems in Leaves of Grass, and you'll see this right away as time draws nigh, the first of the poems that we'll study together. I hope you guys are being challenged and growing through this study. I know I am. Thank you.